Welcome to the Overcoming Challenges in Segmentation webinar, hosted by your friends at Sati Software. My name is Megan Peitz, and I am the Ingenuity Ambassador at Sati Software. When a segmentation project comes through the door, for many of us, it can be both exciting and daunting. So many different techniques, so many different solutions, and so many different client ideas and inputs. And Keith Shun, the Senior Vice President of Sawtooth Analytics, has plenty of experience in this area, experiencing both the good, the bad, and the ugliest of segmentation studies. Being in marketing sciences for over 30 years, Keith is one of the best resources to share with you how to overcome the challenges of segmentation studies. So please enjoy today's webinar and take it away, Keith. That's the topic of today's presentation, overcoming challenges in segmentation. I've been doing segmentation studies, as, as Megan indicated, for more years than I'd like to believe. Uh, some of them have gone very well. Some of them have gone very badly. And I have a pretty good feeling for why some of the ones that go badly go badly. And so that's, what, uh, that's kind of the topic of today's presentation. This isn't really a, a how-to uh, to segmentation algorithms. We've got another presentation uh, about that coming in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, but for today, I want to just very briefly uh, do an overview or uh, distinguish between two different kinds of segmentation. I want to talk about the, the, the three things that I think cause a lot of the challenges that we, we run into, the problems that we run into in segmentation. And I want to talk about a way I think we can overcome those challenges by, by having a good segmentation process. And I want to identify some particular keys to success. So that's kind of the roadmap for where we want to, where we want to go today with our presentation. OK, so the first one is just an overview uh, of a couple different segmentation methods. And because I see the word segmentation used a couple of different ways. And in, in one of those ways, uh, we know which respondents or, or which members of our database are members of what segments. And in that case, we're running something called supervised learning models. We know segment membership, and we want an algorithm for predicting it. Um, so maybe we want to run a, a discriminant analysis, or a logistic regression, or a logit, or a, any one of a number of tree-based methods like shade, or cart, or random forest. So that's, that, that's, that's the kind of segmentation where you actually know what the segment membership is, and all you're trying to do is, is come up with an equation that helps you identify segment members. And that's not the kind that we're talking about today. Today we're talking about what I'd call more segment discovery. Uh, in other words, we don't know which respondents are in what segments. We don't even know who the segments are, or what they are, or what they mean, or what they, uh, how they're characterized. And so we want to create the segments. And this is something called unsupervised learning. There's no dependent variable that supervises, supervises or guides our analysis. Uh, there's no variable resident in our database that identifies segment membership. And for this reason, segment membership isn't visible to us. It's hidden, or it's called it's latent. Latent's just a fancy way of saying we don't have a variable in our database that uh, identifies the segment. But it sounds a lot fancier if you say latent. And uh, as a result, sometimes these are called latent class models. There's a couple different broad categories of, uh, of, of unsupervised models. Uh, there's cluster analysis and then there's latent class analysis. In both cases, uh, the, the segmenting variable is latent. It's hidden. It, needs, it, it is as yet to be discovered. It needs to be created by our analysis. I'm not going to talk about these algorithms in any detail. I will say that in a couple of weeks we're going to do another webinar that's devoted entirely to cluster analysis and how it works. So uh, I certainly invite you to that one and if you're interested. So with that distinction in mind, the fact that we're really going to talk about unsupervised models, where we don't know the segmentation variable going in, but we want to discover it, let's talk about some of the challenges. There, I, I think there are three, three things that make segmentation especially difficult. And the first two uh, are what I would call combinatorial problems. There's a, and the first one is it's just in the, in the very nature of segmentation. Uh, there's some math that works against us and makes it really, really hard. And the other one is kind of resonant, uh, not so much in our data as in human nature. There, there's interactions that, uh, that the people who 
uh, sponsor segmentation studies and the people who perform them have that, that, uh, that, that create a, a second combinatorial problem. So the first one is, let's just say that we're having an especially good day. Uh, we've got a really small little segmentation study. It's got 150 respondents. And somehow, by some, by some magic, maybe we had a dream last night. And in the dream, uh, someone told us that we had exactly four segments. And for some reason, we trust this dream. But we know, for, for whatever reason, we know there's exactly four segments. It turns out that even if you had a very small data set, and even if you had this very specific information about how many segments there are, there are still two to the 10 to the, you know, two times 10 to the 90 different ways to divide those different respondents. That's a bigger number uh, than there are atoms in the universe. And uh, when I was showing this presentation earlier, people said, Keith, you don't have enough charts and graphs in the presentation. So here's a chart uh, that shows, see the, the, the first bar there, the one you don't even see is the number of atoms in the universe. And the second bar, the really long one, is the number of ways to segment 150 people into four segments. Uh, there's, there's actually 500 million times more ways to do that segmenting than there are atoms in the universe. So you get the idea that this is a really, there's just no way to look at every possible segmentation solution. So there, there's just an immense space to cover, and, and we're going to cover only a tiny fraction of those possible ways of dividing that space up. So that's one combinatorial problem that makes our job difficult. Uh, the other is, let's assume that we've got a study that has 50 variables in it. And some of those some of those variables we're going to use to define our segments, and some of them we're going to hold out of the, the cluster analysis or the latent class analysis or whatever, and we're going to use them to uh, characterize or to profile our segments after we've created the segments. It turns out that there's over a <coughs> there's over a trillion ways to separate our variables into those two groups, those that will and won't be used for clustering. As you'd imagine, this is a place where some major league scope creep can happen, right? Because we try, you know, and, and here's so we, what, what I prepared is a, a little, a little uh, scope creep vignette here, uh, a little, a little video exposition of scope creep. So here on the on the left, we've got our our, our, our segmentation sponsor, our client, perhaps, and on the, on the right, we've got our analyst, and uh, the analyst has provided a segmentation solution, but the client says, you know. We looked at that solution with, you know, use, that used variables 1 through 25, and it didn't work. So let's try the clustering again with variables 1 through 10 and 31 through 37. And the agreeable analyst says, sure, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll try that. And, and then, uh, you know, a week later, uh, the, the analyst has rerun the segmentation, redelivered the, the, the report, and, and the, uh, the sponsor says, hmm, well, we're still not happy with the segments. So, so, uh, so let's try variables 1 through 5, 7, 42, 48, 50, and so on. And the analyst says, OK, sure, great. Redoes the segmentation, re-gives it to the client. And uh, I've seen cases where, where this can cycle through. And 30 days later, uh, we have a situation like this. Um, so the analyst is screaming because he's already done eight segmentations, and he doesn't really want to do a, a ninth one. There's, uh, some diminishing returns here, and he's doubtful he's ever going to find anything. So we have to control that scope creep. We have to find a way, a process, to control that scope creep. And then I think the third thing that makes segmentation uh, difficult is that over in the real world, where most of us work, segments are messy. Uh, they're not well defined. They overlap a little bit. Uh, they're not easy to see with our bare, you know, with, with our naked eyes. So if you go to a a textbook, a lot of times you'll see a picture that looks like this. So um, you know, kind of raise your hand if you can tell me how many segments are, are there in this little study with, uh, with two variables. Uh, and if, if, if you look closely, I think you'll discern that there's probably three segments in this data set. Um, so. But, but real, real data sets uh, aren't really like that. The segments aren't uh, very well separated necessarily. So it might look more like this. So this is a little bit more realistic, but even here we've got uh, we've got color telling us how many segments there are. If we took that color away, we'd have this. And now, how many segments do we have? And this problem, I think, is exacerbated by the fact that we don't often have statistics that point us reliably to which what, you know what the true segmentation what the true segmentation is. In addition to that, we're typically working with many more than two dimensions. So we might have those 
know, we might have 10 or 15 or 30 variables that are put into our, our segmentation analysis, and uh, it's even less possible to visualize what's going on uh, than it is here. And here it's kind of hard to see what's going on. This is a really kind of a simple case, actually. Okay, so, so I've, I've talked about what I think the challenges are. Let's talk about maybe what some of the solutions could be. And I think, uh, I, I think uh, over the course of my experience with segmentation, if, if we can put in place a nice segmentation process, uh, uh, an agreed upon uh, process that we're going to follow, I think we can navigate a lot of those problems. And so here's what I think of are, are the, 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 the three main elements of that process are that we're going to want to identify what the basis variables are. And I'll talk about what basis variables are in a minute. We're going to want to generate some segments and we're going to want to add value. Let's talk about identifying those variables. Basis variables are the variables that we're going to use to define our segment. They're the ones that we're going to put into the segmentation machine to make segments come out. Profiling variables are all the other variables in our survey. Whatever we didn't use to generate our segment, we can use to characterize or profile our segment, to validate them, and hopefully bring them to life and make them credible and believable. And it, it, we really have to let our segmentation objectives determine which, base, which are the basis and which are the profiling variables. And, and it's right here, right at the start, that I see a lot of problems happen with segmentation studies because we don't have a clear agreement about what the objectives are. And so that whole scope creep vignette that I, I shared a minute ago, this is where it comes in. If, 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 we have a, if we have a firm set of objectives here and say, hey, look, we're trying to segment people with respect to, uh, you know, we want to find out how, how you know, different attitudinal segments uh, compare. Well, well then, you know, if, if we can do that, we can say, okay, we're going to focus on, on attitudes. We're not going to throw demographics into the segmentation mix. We're not going to throw behaviors in there. Uh, we're just going to focus on on, uh, on attitudes or whatever. So I think getting that kind of agreement up front, and, and, and in my experience, it's been helpful to really formalize that, to, to show this segmentation process to clients right at the beginning of the segmentation study and say, here's what we're going to do, and by such and such a date, we're going to agree on what the, the, the basis variables are. And oh, by the way, that date's going to happen before we even go to field. We're not going to be playing guessing games once we go in the field. We really want to nail this stuff down early and, and be very, very clear about it. Because if, if you have that scope creep happen, you're going to have clients who are paying more money than they wanted for their segmentation study, analysts who aren't getting enough sleep, and everybody's unhappy. And we don't want people to be unhappy. So what are some possible basis variables that we can use? Well, I mentioned psychographics, you know, attitudes or perceptions. Sometimes we like to use demographics for our basis variables. We could use behaviors. Uh, or maybe we want to do a needs-based segmentation where we're going to segment people on the basis of their needs or values or utilities. So here's some pros and cons. Uh, one of the nice things about using demographics as our basis variables is that they're easily observable. Uh, it's, it's easy to get this information about people. They're, they're easy to collect. Uh, oftentimes, they're easy to connect up with our clients' internal databases. Unfortunately, uh, demographics aren't sometimes or oftentimes aren't particularly well related to attitudes, behaviors, or values. Or values. And I know, so here, I mean, are you the same as, as, as your neighbors? Could someone look at your neighbors and, uh, and come to firm beliefs about your attitudes about things, or your values, or your behaviors? And, and the answer is often not. I mean, we're not all the same. And uh, we, we differ, I think, in ways that demographics don't, don't often well capture. Sometimes they do. In, in some markets, I've seen demographics work very, very well. Uh, but in other markets, they, they just don't work so well. Um, when it comes to psychographics or attitudes or percep perceptions, uh, one, of the, one of the major shortcomings of those is that we tend to measure them with rating scales. And rating scales are subject to halo effects and scale use biases, and those can just ruin a segmentation study. Um, in, in fact, if you're going to do an attitudinal segmentation, I, I often tell clients, here's what's going to happen when we run the segmentation. The most reliable solution we're going to get is a three-segment solution. Uh, we're going to have a segment of high raters, a segment of low raters, 
and a segment in between. And I don't know how many times I've seen that result come out of an attitudinal segmentation. Um, and, and so, you know, to, to the point where I almost always, if someone does that kind of segmentation, I almost always see a segment of people that gets a name something like the want it alls because they want everything. They rate everything high in their attitudinal uh, segment. And then there's a, a segment of, of low raters who basically they're, they're disengaged with the, uh, with the category or whatever. And then a group of people or maybe, you know, that are in between. We could, uh, we could segment on the basis of behaviors, which may or may not be tied closely to attitudes or to client database variables. Uh, and there's the, the further problem that self-reported and observed behaviors may differ. So the behaviors you collect in a survey and the, co the behaviors you collect from, uh, from sort of some sort of behavioral database, maybe you've got sales records or something like that, uh, they can differ. Uh, often quite a bit they can differ, actually. And then finally, if we, you know, if we wanted to measure needs, we want to do a needs-based segmentation and do some sort of conjoint or uh, choice model or max diff experiment or something. Um, the trouble with that is it, is it can make our segmentation questionnaires pretty lengthy because on top of a segmentation that's questionnaire that's already full of profiling variables, we're going to throw in a 10-minute choice exercise. So none of these... Uh, none of these are a, a perfect solution to which basis variables we should use. They're really, it's really going to depend on what your objectives are, and it, it really, and, and, and none of these are perfect. So they all come with their own, uh, their own strengths and weaknesses, just as a warning. So sometimes, uh, sometimes folks will say, well, really, uh, then we should, we should, we should combine these. Let, let's do a segmentation that includes demographic variables and psychographics, and hey, let's throw some behaviors in there as well. And the, uh, so let's do a multi-base segmentation. And the trouble I found with that is if you just throw everything into kind of a garbage can model where everything goes in and the, the model cranks it away and then you get some segments out, what I usually see happen is some segments that are very diluted. Uh, and, and I think the reason is that the segmentation algorithm is based they're, they just want to see, and, and they want to see differences, and they're perfectly happy to see lots of small differences on lots of variables. Uh, they're as happy to see that as they are to see a few big differences on a smaller number of variables. And so, oftentimes, I see a kind of dilution happening with this kind of segmentation, and, and really, that's the exact opposite. We really want to see some big, interesting differences. We don't want to see a lot of little tiny differences that, that might add up to be big, but no one of them is big enough to get excited about. Um, sometimes it helps, uh, if, if we know this is what we want to do going in, sometimes it helps to do something called cluster ensemble analysis that uh, you'll hear about more in a couple weeks. You might want to do a, a demographic segmentation and then do a psychographic segmentation and then take the results of those two segmentations and put them into a, an ensemble analysis to come up with a third segmentation that combines the two. So that might be a, might be kind of a way around that problem. So we talked about you know the need to identify a set of profiling variables to use and, and, and to come to some agreement about so we don't get into this cycle of well let's try this, let's try that. The next step I think in the process is to generate segments. And again, uh, you can tune in in two weeks when my colleague Brian McEwen, who's pictured here, uh, will walk you through how to use cluster analysis, and we'll talk to you about uh, convergent cluster, key means cluster analysis and about cluster ensembles analysis. So I'm, I'm not really going to uh, talk about that here. I'll just I'll put that off and so you can learn more about how these methods work in a couple of weeks. So that brings us to different kinds of analyses. And uh, I mentioned earlier that there's, there's basically there's cluster analysis and there's latent class analysis. So with cluster analysis, we've got, uh, we've got hierarchical cluster analysis that makes cluster trees. We've got k-means analysis that tends to make uh, spherical uh, clusters. We've got convergent k-means cluster analysis, CCAA. And then we've got uh, cluster ensembles analysis, which basically takes a large number of cluster solutions, uh, combines those solutions, and then segments on the solutions themselves. Uh, which has turned out to be a really powerful way to do cluster analysis. Um, so those are different ways of doing cluster analysis. Then in terms of latent class analysis, there's something called latent class clustering, where we don't really have a, we don't really have a statistical model. It works just like cluster analysis. You throw your variables in, and it, it, it gives you groups out. 
Uh, but then there's also latent class uh, regression and latent class multinomial logit, and those are models where the, the latent classes simultaneously uh, create groups of respondents, segments of respondents, and model coefficients. So they, they kind of pick groups of respondents that have different regression coefficients or different logit coefficients if you're building a choice model. And that can obviously be pretty powerful too because it's, it's a nice way to do uh, needs-based segmentation that's very model-driven. Okay. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, really allow us to, uh, to, to get robust solutions because they allow us to do a lot of replication. So in convergent cluster analysis, for instance, CCA, we're oftentimes running 30 cluster analysis models at a time, and we're going to pick the one solution that has the most in, in common across the other 29. So we're not picking an outlier solution that, hey, if we did the research again tomorrow, we wouldn't find it. We're picking a robust solution. And, and the same with the other methods that I've got highlighted there uh, in orange. And two of those methods, the CCA and the convergent cluster ensemble analysis, uh, they work well even if we've got scores or hundreds of replications. Uh, the latent class models start to take a long time to run. Uh, if you've ever tried running latent class, you get up to eight, uh, nine, ten segments that you can start, you know, that, that, that ten segment solution can take, you know, a couple, two, three hours to run sometimes, depending on your sample size. And, uh, you know, taking that out even higher, you know, to 14, 15 segments or whatever, or, uh, or, or can, can take a longer time to run. And also, if you want to run those lots of times, so, so each, each one of those can take a long time. So if you, if you want to run even a smaller number of segments, like you want to run a four-segment solution, but you want to run it 30 times, can take a long time to run, uh, much fast, much longer than uh, the cluster analysis methods take. So that's just, a, just kind of a caution there. So, so I've, I've talked a little bit about how we're going to, you know, the, the kind of methods we're going to use to make those, to generate those segments, and you'll learn more about those methods again in a couple weeks. And then the last part of the process uh, is about adding value. And so, so now we've, we've identified our basis variables, we've generated some segments, now it comes time to report all that to our client. How are we going to do it? Well, typically, uh, we, we provide a set of, of basic deliverables. Uh, typically, there's some sort of tabular reports where we define the segments in terms of the basis variables, and then we, uh, we further characterize those segments in terms of the profiling variables. And I, back in the 80s, when, when these things were still all printed out on paper, uh, killing large forests worth of trees in the process, I had a client complain that he, the one thing he hated about his segmentation studies is uh, he could expect to receive three linear feet of crosstabs in, uh, in, in, you know, via FedEx. So he, he, just, he just didn't have the shelf space to do segmentation anymore. So I think nowadays we probably don't print all that stuff up on paper, um, but, but the idea is kind of the same. In addition to that, to those basic deliverables, where we're going to show segment means in terms of the basis variables and the profiling variables, um, there's a couple of, of value-add deliverables that I, I think are, are, are good to provide our clients. And the first one are, are per, I, I've heard called personas. And, and uh, basically, this is just a, sort of an in-depth, qualitative reporting of our segments that helps turn them into people. So we want to give them a catchy name. We want to give them a face and a personality. We want to give them a set of values, beliefs, and behaviors, some brand preferences, channel behaviors, and so on. We'd like to take our segments and not just have it be, you know, segment B from the four-segment solution. We want it to be a person. We want, it to, we want it to be a person that stands for that segment. Um, even though it's a little bit, you know, even though there's variety within that segment that we have to recognize, uh, I think it helps, it, it helps us understand uh, segments from kind of a storytelling standpoint if, if those segments become people. And uh, a bit of humility here, uh, quantitative researchers, uh, you know, we can do a good job creating those segments and running those algorithms and doing all that fancy stuff but I've almost never seen it to be the case that the person who generates the segments is also the person who's good at turning them into human people. Um, I've, I've usually found that qualitative researchers are much better at that than quantitative researchers are. Just Maybe it's my, my experience or whatever, but that, that's kind of what I've seen is that it's, that's kind of a good time to get it, you know, to bring in someone with those qualitative skills uh, when it comes time to report your segments if you want them to be accepted by your client. 
And then lastly, the other value add thing I think that our that our segmentation studies should uh, should include is a segment classifier, or sometimes called a typing tool, because this adds shelf life to our study. It enables our clients to do to, to take future research studies and future respondents and put them into our segments today. So if we can create a typing tool, let's say we we do a segmentation analysis and then we run a discriminant analysis and we identify the eight questions that help us classify new respondents into existing segments. Um, that's great uh, because now we have a, a little battery of eight questions, uh, and uh, we can we can use that battery of questions in the future without having to reproduce the entire segmentation questionnaire, which is which is kind of handy. And at this point, those those these typing tools or classifiers, they're using supervised learning models, the same kind of tools uh, that, that we talked about earlier when we know what the segment membership is, because now we have a we have a segment membership variable in our database. It's no longer uh, it's no longer hidden from us, that, that information. We know who is in what segment. As well, if we have one of these uh, segment classification tools in hand, it can allow us to uh, sometimes to type uh, respondent, to, to type members of our clients' databases. So uh, I've had clients, uh, a banking client once, with millions of records in their database. And they said, well, now we've done a segmentation study, we'd like to know who in our database belongs to what segment. So this, this is going to work well if segment membership and those database variables are related. And, and this is another one of those things where if, if this isn't part of the objectives early in the study, it's almost guaranteed not to work later on. Because it's, it's, you, have to, you have to be having a really lucky day that your segment membership is just going to happen to be correlated with, your data, with any of your database variables. In fact, and, and many, many times I've tried this and it's just failed kind of miserably. But if we know that going in, we can change the way we do our segmentation and give ourselves a higher chance of it working. Uh, one of the best examples, I think, is called reverse segmentation. It's uh, kind of a neat method uh, that, uh, that Ula Jones and Curtis Frazier and, some, and uh, Murphy and Wurst uh, developed and talked about at our 2006 conference. And so that's... Uh, that's a really nice one. It requires a really big sample size, but, it, but if you've got a really big sample size, uh, I've seen it do very nice job. Uh, predictive segmentation is one I've seen done in the world of uh, pharmaceuticals marketing research quite a bit. Basically, uh, you take your database variables and you uh, you look for which, before you even run segmentation, you look at which of your segmentation variables are correlated with your database variables, uh, and then you only use those in your segmentation. And we talked a little bit about you. We could uh, again, we could use convergent cluster ensembles to include some of those database variables in, right into the uh, the ensemble, or we could use something called nascent linkage maximization from a paper that uh, Chris Diener and his colleagues did back in 2002 at the American Marketing Association's uh, Art Forum. And uh, what what they did is they said, you know, you've got to realize that when you've got say you've got four clusters sitting out there in this multidimensional space. Within each cluster, you've got some people who are really close to the middle of the cluster, and a lot of people who are kind of out on the edges. And a lot of those people who are out on the edges are almost as close to the other clusters as they are to the cluster that we've assigned them to. And we could really, they call them fence sitters. And they said, you know, really, we could shift those fence sitters around a little bit uh, to really firm up the relationships between the, you know, the observable, the demographic, or the database variables. Uh, and, and, the, and the segments without changing really who these segments are, and they developed an algorithm for doing that. So you might want to check out that paper uh, if you'd be interested in that. And that leads us here to, uh, so, so we talked about what some of the problems are, we talked about a process that I, I think the, while it may be difficult to adhere to, I, when we can succeed in doing that, I think we can save ourselves a lot of headaches. So let's just wrap it up here with some, uh, some keys to success. <clears throat> And in case it wasn't clear from the process, I think the uh, the most important key to success is the first one here. And and that's that we should be clear about our objectives. We, we should, uh, at the very beginning of our segmentation study, we should work backwards from, hey, what information do we need to what do we deliver to the, to the methodology and not let our methodology drive that process. We should really start from what the information needs here. Because lack of clarity here 
is, is going to be, I think, the primary cause of over-budget products, projects and overworked analysts and unsatisfied clients. Uh, th this is where a lot of problems start. And so having that kind of clear communication with clients, I think, is, is key to making your segmentation study work. Okay, so a second, uh, a second key to successful segmentation is to have a big enough sample size. You know, I used a silly example earlier when I said we, we know that there's four segments in, a day, you know, in our sample of 150 people. In most cases, we wouldn't do a segmentation study with 150 people in it because what, we, what we'd really like to know is, hey, once we've done our segmentation analysis, are our segments different? And if you, if you divide 150 people four ways and you're averaging 40 respondents or thereabouts per segment, you're not going to have any statistical power to say whether these segments are different or not. Uh, you're really not going to be in a position to know. So a rule of thumb I like to use is to have at least two or three hundred, to, you know, to say I, I really want two or three hundred respondents in each of my segments to realize that I'm likely to have three, four, or five segments. It's, it's not often we have more. Uh, so I typically recommend, you know, hey, let's, let's have at least 1,500 respondents. And, and like all things sample size, more is always better. If we could have 5,000 instead of 1,500, that would be even better. Now, I realize we can't always do that. Uh, some universes aren't even as big as 1,500 respondents. And so uh, particularly in some B2B studies I've worked on and some pharmaceutical studies, we've had to use, we've had to do segmentation where there are fewer respondents just because uh, that's all the population will allow. However, for, for general purpose consumer research, I think that 1,500 number is not a bad place to start thinking from. We should use discriminating measures. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that you know, things like rating scales have this problem of uh, you know, different people use the scales different ways. And we, uh, you know, we can be segmenting in terms of a scale use bias rather than on any, any realistic sort of thing. Uh, in, in, in my experience, when we can use trade-off type methods, conjoint analysis or max diff, or even things like Q sorts, when we force people to make trade-offs, uh, I, th I think we usually get uh, we get better measures, particularly for doing needs-based segmentation. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in passing, and that's that we want to have a robust analysis. Because, again, there's billions and trillions and hundreds of billions of possible solutions, and uh, some of them are going to be, some of them are going to have a lot in common with one another, and some of them are going to be outliers, right? So. If we did the segmentation study tomorrow with a different set of, of 1,000 respondents, or if we split our sample in half and did you know, a segmentation study on one half and another segmentation study on another half, you'd really hope that you'd get kind of the same answer both times, right? And that's what, that's what I mean by robustness. It's reliability. It's the fact that if we, if we repeat the study again under similar circumstances, we'll get a similar answer. Because we don't want to base our marketing strategy on some sort of outlier solution, some, some solution that's here today and gone tomorrow, or else we find ourselves marketing to ghosts, right? That's, uh, that's a formula for disaster. <clears throat> and we also can't rely on, we can't just rely on our ability to tell a story. We can't just run one cluster analysis and say, hey, does this make sense? And look at it and say, well, yeah, sure, I, I kind of, that, that segment two, I, I know him, he's my neighbor Joe, you know? And segment three, that, you know, that's my cousin, and yeah, I, I can make sense of this, you know? Because the, the, the truth is that humans are, are good storytellers. And I've illustrated this to audiences before. I've gone to clients and I've taken, you know, I've taken data from a segmentation study, randomly changed all the labels on the variables and said, hey, tell me what this means. And they can come up with perfectly good stories. And to make matters worse, marketers, who are typically the clients for segmentation, they're better storytellers than most people are. So we, we don't really want to run a single segmentation ask the client if it's credible and then run with it. That's just, uh, to me, that, that borders on research malpractice. I, I think we really have to do our homework. We have to run some robust methods and make sure that the solution we're reporting uh, is, is one that has a lot of commonality among other solutions so that we're reporting real structure in the data and not a figment of our imagination. I have a, one I heard one fellow call marketing segmentation once, he called it market figmentation, just to get the idea across that Sometimes uh, you know we're in danger of just making stuff up if we're not careful. And then we should provide our clients with the kind of outputs that allow them to make decisions. We should you know we should give a clear definition and profiling in the segments. And, and the reason is you know 
the client knows their market better than the analyst does, and he needs to assess the credibility of the candidate solutions. I mean, once we've done our homework and we found a few viable solutions that look good statistically, you know, they're robust, they appear to represent real structure in the data, and we get it to the point where we say, well, you know, Mr. Client, uh, it looks like we've got a, a three or a four or maybe a six segment solution here, but hey, you know this market better than we do. Um, why don't you tell us which one of these is the most credible? And to the extent that we can run statistics and, and, and say, hey, we've narrowed it down to the three, four, and six segment solution, uh, that helps too. So we, we, you know, it's not that we want to ignore the statistical evidence, but I don't think the statistical evidence is sufficient to, 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 to bring us to a, uh, a correct solution. I really think we need the client's managerial judgment for that. And then we want to add shelf life, right? We want to provide a segment classifier, or we want to be able to classify uh, records from the database into our segments. And as I've kind of harped on through this whole presentation, um, working, working together as a team, the clients and the analysts working together as a team is really the big thing. If there's one theme that kind of ties all of this together, it, it's that uh, the problems usually start here. And the more we can make explicit agreements and understand the process and communicate the process, and here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, um, I, I think we can, we can, we can that, that's really the key to successful segmentation. And I think the three key decision points are, are the ones we talked about earlier, uh, you know, being clear about what the objectives are and what deliverables do we expect. Um, making sure to distinguish between basis variables and profiling variables and, and to try to keep out of that, you know, that constant loop of, well, let's try this, let's try that. And, and, then, and then, you know, thirdly, to come up with, uh, you know, once the analyst provides a set of statistically defensible, reproducible solutions, the client and the analyst should agree on which one to use for their final reporting purposes. Um, it, it's really good, I think, if analysts don't hand clients a single solution and pretend that it's the absolute truth for all time because we really don't know that. Uh, again, there's a little bit of call here for analyst humility. I think. And with that, I've got, uh, I've got some references if you want to read more about segmentation. And uh, if not, uh, I think we can uh, have Megan back on. We can, we can uh, hopefully some questions have come in. So, uh, yes, they have, Keith, and thanks so much. That was perfect. One thing I did want to add, too, is that you know, most of this presentation, we've been talking about segmenting at the respondent level, right, and determining personas for, for people, essentially. But you can also do segmentation on occasions or experiences. Um, typically, a, a respondent will answer about that. But if you think I had a um, pizza client one time who wanted to kind of understand what kind of occasions people were ordering pizza for. And as you can imagine, you know, when you have kids, maybe they have a soccer party and you're ordering completely different than when you're ordering for a Friday night at home or for a date night. And so different, you know, one person could have different types of occasions. And so they wanted to use an occasion-based segmentation to develop marketing materials and promotions. So I uh, just wanted to add that as an example as well. Um, all right, so let's see, for the question, so you had mentioned earlier, Keith, um, about the you know, power of using a discrete choice technique in order to segment um, your respondents. And being on the client side, as you also mentioned, it's really critical to make sure that you can recreate the solution and um, create a, an algorithm for them. So uh, one of our attendees wanted to know if you've seen conjoint and or max diff segmentations with a typing tool that is actually straightforward and not terribly time-consuming um, for the respondent? That's a good question. Uh, in fact, we've got a couple of white papers um, up on our website, and I can, I can direct you to those, because th this, this question comes up a lot, as you can imagine. So we've developed, um, we, we described an algorithm, and we've, we've got it programmed, actually, that we'll do, that we'll take the max diff data or conjoint data or whatever, and come up with uh, instead of having each respondent have to do the whole max diff survey so you can get their utilities so you can put them in segments, <clears throat> once you've done the segmentation, it allows you to, uh, to come up with a, a short list, a small set of questions that will effectively allow you to put people in segments. So uh, <clears throat> I'll get that referenced out. When, when, we, when we send out answers to these, um, I'll, I'll, 
I'll pull the links to that to those references so you can read up on them. Uh, I say we've programmed it. I, I should be clear. We we haven't made it ready for prime time. It's not uh, commercial ready software. It's it's still uh, it's still kind of rough and it's it's uh, it's a pain to use. So it's it's something that we use ourselves sometimes for clients, but uh, we haven't sold it as commercial software yet. Perfect. Great. And hey, thanks for um, starting to share your webcam. Just want to make sure you knew you were on that. <laughs> Because I can see I, your I face now. <laughs> uh oh, well, we, we have six. Hey, that. That, you that look was... good in your orange. Everybody knows Keith wears orange, so there's there's proof. <laughs> oh no, sorry about that. I was I lost my audio connection. I was just pressing buttons madly to get it back. I don't know what else is being shown. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe? Um, is there a sweet spot you think you have for the, the number of base variables? And, you know, if your client is asking you to use more and throw, you know, that whole list into the kitchen sink, uh, how do you recommend they reduce that list? And do you like factor analysis or do you um, try to get rid of variables that are correlated? Can you kind of talk about maybe paring down uh, a base variable list and if you have any rules of thumb? Oh, that's a good one. Um, Certainly, if, 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 if you read a lot of the literature on segmentation, it talks about keeping that list of variables, of, of basis variables, pretty small. So a lot of commercial studies were, were, were throwing 70 or 80 or 100 variables in. Uh, a lot of times, I, I think that's probably not a good idea. I, I'd, I'd really like to see things more in the, hey, let's have you know 10 or 20 variables in there if we could get it down that small. I do like factor analysis, but you know, Factor analysis um, works really well when we've done our psychometric homework. When, when, when we're factor analyzing, when the list of items that we're factor analyzing was put together with factor analysis in mind, right? So, but let's say we had we, we, we theorized that there were eight dimensions that we wanted to measure, and then we went and we wrote three items for each dimension, and then we factor analyzed it and got eight factors. I'd feel really good about that. But most of our attribute lists that we work with. Uh, we've gotten lazy as marketing researchers, right? So uh, we, we have a list of 70 items, and, 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 and who knows where they came from, right? I mean, 30 of them are from our tracking study that's been going on for 30 years. And uh, you know, we got a new, uh, a new uh, head of marketing, and he added 10 more. And then the, you know, the, uh, the PR agency, you know, there's four or five things they want to say, so they've added a few items. And now all of a sudden we've got a hodgepodge. There's really no reason to think that hodgepodge is going to factor very nicely. Um, you know, when we haven't done our homework to make factor analysis work, I think it's not going to work very well. We're, we're going to end up with one big factor that explains a lot of stuff, for example. Uh, or we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a list of, you know, just of, of items that don't factor well. So, so I'd be a little bit leery about using factor analysis in that case. But I, I don't have any problem with using factor analysis per se, although some people do. There, there are some people who say, you know, there's, 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 there's a certain amount of smoothing that happens when you do factor analysis. And, you know, if you had 40 items that are supposed to, you know, that are supposed to measure 10 factors, rather than doing factor analysis, just put all 40 items in there because, because when you do factor analysis to smooth them, you're not giving cluster analysis anything to grab onto. And, 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 and you know, if, if you gave cluster analysis more to work with, it would do a better job. So, so, so there are definitely people who are uh, opposed to factor analysis. I'm not one of them, but uh, mm -hmm. you could be if you wanted to be. <laughs> You'd be in good company. So you talk, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you, and you talked about you know this this relationship with the client and trying to get them you know to understand these space variables. You know, sometimes though they don't really know what it is that they want. So do you have any recommendations on you know what types of questions to ask your client or um, do you, you know, just take the lead if the client doesn't know where they want to go by listening to the objectives? Do you have any sort of comments on that? It's more of a consulting type question than an actual impl implementation oh. question, but I think it's a good one. Well, you know, you could buy a cattle prod, but um, <laughs> that's often counterproductive. You know, I, I, I've really, when, it, when I've gotten that to work well, I've, I've, been, I've worked with strong, when I was, on, when I, when I was a marketing research supplier, uh, on occasion, I worked with very strong salespeople who had the gumption to go back and tell their clients, you know, this segmentation study is going to fail unless you know you can you can come to some conclusions here. Uh, the other time I've seen the other way I've seen of handling that problem is through pricing. Basically, um, 
here's a price for a segmentation study, but each time we change the list of basis variables and have to rerun it, the price is going to go up by X percent. Uh, some people you can appeal through, you know, you can appeal to through their pocketbooks, but uh, uh, other people are just almost impossible to control. And, and so I, although I say, hey, that's really the way we ought to do it, that that's really a call to we've got to try to do that. It, it's not a guarantee that you're always going to succeed. You are there are some clients who just uh, uh, resist that kind of control, and they, they don't want their creativity impeded by things like uh, you know a smooth work process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, have that and, and of, right. Yeah, and one of the things I think of as well on my end is, you know, maybe they don't know what they want to put into the model, but they may know what they want to get out of it, right? So asking your client some sort of like expectations or what do you think these segments are going to look like, and and then examining those variables. You know, a lot of times I will look at histograms of all of the data just to see is there any differentiation across respondents or are people pretty much responding the same way and you already know that that as a base variable may not be as helpful to differentiating across segments. Um, so, you know, it, it's definitely a process and there's that's why, it, you know, like we said, it's an art and a science. You know, there's no hard and fast way to say, you know, this is the routine for determining those base variables and, and that upfront part is where you're going to spend a lot, a lot of time and where you should expect to a lot of time as well. And you know, another, um, another thing that, that works, I think, I, I, I worked at a consulting firm once, and the consulting firm had a great process for segmentation studies. The first thing we would do as soon as the client uh, bought a segmentation study from us is we would have what we called a, uh, a wargaming session with them. And we would, we would mm -hmm. actually go and we would take the results of a previous segmentation study, we would change all the labels on our variables, we would show the client the results, and then we'd say, you know, is, is this what you need? Could you use this? How would you use this for your marketing strategy? And that, at, at, while we, you know, while we were watching them think through those results and how they would make plans and how they would, you know, what elements, what levers of their marketing strategy they were willing or able to pull, a lot of times that really helped us gauge what kind of variables ought to be the basis variables in the segmentation because we could see them. Uh, really using some of the variables and not the others, and, and that allowed us to be much more intelligent about what we included. Um, Interesting. Now, Keith, um, what about using, um, let's say you're doing a tracking study, right? And would you recommend doing a segmentation each wave on the data, or would you recommend just using a typing tool? I mean, I have my opinion, but I'd like to hear what you have to say first. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, part of it would depend on the sample size, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. if it's a tracking study with uh, 2,000 people a wave, I'm going to feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, but you really, you really would like the segments to stay the same. Even if you're going to allow the right. size of the segments to, to change from one wave to the next, if the very segment identities change one wave to the next, I, I think it limits the utility for marketing. Uh, unless that mm -hmm. kind of change is really happening that rapidly in the market, and it's it's not many markets where change happens quite that rapidly. So, so mm -hmm. I, I might do something in between, right? I I might do a I might do some sort of cluster analysis on the first wave of the data and say, okay, these are the segments that we want to track. Once I have those centroids, I don't even have to do a, a classification algorithm, right? I can just go ahead and assign people to the nearest centroid the next time I do in the next wave. So it becomes a simple mathematical operation that doesn't involve any analytics at all. Interesting. Yeah, I, w I was kind of thinking middle ground as well too, right? So you do the first wave and you get your clusters and you, and you have your algorithms, but it might be nice to do another wave or two, you know, depending on how frequent you're doing the waves and depending on how many sample you have. But to see, you know, reproducibility is a very big issue with segmentation, right? So is it that your segments are changing over time quickly or are these segments, you know, that you found in the first wave repeatable and reproducible? And at that point, once you can determine one way or the other, that can kind of guide um, what you do moving forward. Yeah, and that, that reproducibility is, is really key. That first segmentation really has to be reproducible or, or else you're, you're, you know, your subsequent waves, you're going you're gonna to be thinking that the market's changing when all you had was an initial solution that wasn't reproducible. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith, do you have any opinion on any types of data to avoid using as base variables in the segmentation? So some examples would be like brand volume or category and brand usage or um, 
you know, I, I always think of variables of different types, you know, cate you know, incorporating a categorical and a numerical within uh, your segmentation-based variables and the effect that that can have. Um, do you have any information on what to avoid when in inputting base variables? Well, you know, once upon a time, like, like you, I would have said, you know, it's a bit of a problem to combine categorical and metric variables because even if you standardize them and have them have the same mean and variance, the patterns mm -hmm. of, that, of that dispersion are going to be different in ways that can dramatically affect your segmentation. So I, I would have once upon a time cautioned against that. Um, but now there's, there's algorithms, there are segmentation algorithms uh, available in R that allow you to use uh, both uh, categorical and metric variables. For that matter, you can use uh, some latent class programs. Uh, latent Gold, I think, is one that allows you to, to do both. So mm -hmm. that, that's a concern mm -hmm. that I really don't have much anymore. And what, you know, when I think about whole categories of types of variables, I've segmented so many populations on so many things, I, I don't have something that I would automatically just not do. Mm -hmm. Do you? Not that I, not that I know of. I mean, you know, one of the examples in the question was brand volume, um, and so one of the things that makes me worry is, is extremities of those, you know, of the brands that you're testing. So, like I said, I would probably look at the distribution of the data and make sure that it wasn't so extreme that the variable itself would would control all of the actual clusters. Yeah. Um, that, that's but something I'd handle through a transform, right? I might maybe a right, log transform yeah. or something like that. When you when you've got those kind of extremes, uh, you can usually transform them to be not problems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what about segmentations that are done across different countries? Can you um, do a cluster analysis on data from the U.S. and then use that? you know, either the, your comment before about using the centroids or using a typing tool on other countries? Or would you recommend having different segments across different countries and then you run into, you know, maybe having too many segments for an organization to understand and, and act upon? Uh, what's your take on that? Oh, that's a great question because I've had clients go both ways on that, right? I've, I've had clients who say, we want one worldwide marketing plan and that means we want the same market, same segments in each market. So what we want you to do is, you know, we want to interview people in 20 countries, but we want you to throw it all into one segmentation and, and get one set of segments out of it. But I've had other clients who say, you know, our marketing is such that we don't have to sell to Americans the same way we sell to Frenchmen, the same way to, we sell to folks in, Ch in China. And, and so they, they, they want country-specific or sometimes continent-specific segmentation. But that has more to do with, I think, the objectives than with uh, any decision the analyst makes. And mm -hmm. I think we can handle it. I think we as analysts can handle it either way, whatever whatever the marketing people need, I think we can accommodate. Definitely. And, and one other thought there too is, you know, we've done so much research on uh, how people use scales across different countries. And so if your base variables are scale data, then that's another thing that you're going to have to consider as well, right? Um, so just, just some yeah, interesting things, lot, lots to think about. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 know that, we know that people in different countries use rating scales differently. And if, if you throw a bunch of countries together and you, you've got rating scale data, uh, unless you've been very, very careful about uh, uh, making them comparable, having some comparable items that you could scale the rest to or some such thing, um, you're almost mm -hmm. certainly going to uh, <laughs> create a mess for yourself because you're, you're going to have scale use bias contributing to the formation of, of, of your clusters. And, and that's, that's something you, you really don't want clusters that differ only in terms of scale, right? You, you really want clusters that differ in terms of underlying values or perceptions or whatever it is you're trying to measure. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for um, one more question. Let me see what else is coming in. Um, all right, so the last one would be talking about distance, distance metrics. So we hear a lot about you know Euclidean versus Mahalanobis versus you know city block. Can you talk about um, which distance metrics you should use when creating a cluster? Wow. Well, that, that's a really that, that's we get into that in another version of this uh, of this uh, presentation where we talk about different distance metrics because there are literally an infinite number of, of different metrics you can use even even with just one of the metrics which is uh, something called a power metric, um, the power distance. There, there's literally an infinite number of ways you can compute a power distance. And a Euclidean is just one 
uh, one particular instance of a, of, of a power metric sort of uh, segmentation. So I, I don't really have, you know, once upon a time I, I would have, I would have said, you know, I, I used to really like Mahalanobis distance. It just, it, it seemed very sensible to me. And over the years, I haven't really seen that it's made, that, that, that it makes much difference using Mahalanobis, Mahalanobis as opposed to just a Euclidean distance. And I, I think, mm -hmm. I think I've even seen it matter less now that we use cluster ensembles. I was just going to say that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> th th than it did when we used, uh, you know, k-means uh, cluster analysis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the big thing I suppose would be if you've got categorical data, you, you're going to have to use a distance metric that works with categorical data as opposed to metric data. But but with metric, I I I haven't found a lot of reason to 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 veer away from Euclidean distance. I I just haven't. I have I personally haven't seen the reason, and and I've I've looked at it several times. So. Maybe someone else's experience is different, but I'm, in that respect, I'm kind of a simple guy, I guess. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing, Keith. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that that is um, all the time we have, and we actually got through all, almost all of the questions. So uh, if, they, if your question was unanswered, we will make sure to answer that in an email. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. We hope that we piqued your interest, and we would love to see you on the 18th with Brian McEwen as we go through um, the cluster, convergent cluster ensemble analysis software that SOCU software actually provides. So looking forward to seeing you then, and thanks again, everybody.